Hello and welcome to your weekly ascent up the mountain of electric cars from the team at electrifying.com. This week we'll be talking about Amoda's UK plans, the new mini electric, petrol price parity and the new smart hashtag five. We'll also be answering your electric car questions and dipping into the post bag to find out more of your views on everything electric. Welcome to the Kilowatt Half Hour. I'm Mike. And I'm Tom. How you been, Tom? I've been good. I've been actually been driving things and doing things this week, so I've got stuff to talk about. Excellent, excellent. Less waffle, more talking about cars. This is good. <laughs> what you had? So, uh, well, well, I have. Uh, I was told that there was a mini electric coming for me to try, which is very nice, and it was something of a surprise to find out it's the John Cooper Works edition when it turned up. So it's oh, got really? all the spoilers and big wheels and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's it's proper bling. Um, <laughs> And I haven't looked up the price, but no doubt it's going to be a million pounds or something because it's got <laughs> all the options on it. Um, but yeah, that was a bit of a nice surprise. Although, as we've established on previous podcasts, I'm getting old. Yes. And I did kind of drive down the road and think, oh. <laughs> Has it got a comfort setting? Yeah. <clears throat> no, it hasn't really. It has got an eco setting, which tends to make things better. It's, it's, it's lovely. The way they've thought it out to make it an experience mm -hmm. is that uh, it's got like a, a fake key that you twist to start the engine. Okay. Although they don't call it an engine, otherwise Ginny gets upset. And then there's another switch which brings on experiences. And these change, you know, it's got this enormous OLED circular screen in the middle, and it changes the way that the dials yeah. look. So you can have a... Um, like a retro looking one that has like a 1958 mini speedo on it and makes nice. slightly engine noises. Mm. Um, there's a go-kart one that makes everything racy and tightens up the throttle responses and the steering and makes it more go-karty. Yeah. Um, and there's an eco setting and there's a, uh, there's one which I, I think, I think it's called balance, but it basically means compromise, which is between them all, which is the, the best setting of all. But just around here on, on like, Pothold roads. It's yeah. It makes my fat bits wobble all the time, and it's just like oh, it's a bit tiresome. On a racetrack, it would be hilarious, and on a smooth road, brilliant. But I don't think Britain's got the roads. <laughs> JCW at the moment is just too sporty. I'm I'm too old for that. Give me some comfort instead. But the rest of it's lovely. I mean the the way they've made. The interior, I mean, I don't know how much it is, as I said, but it's, you know, if it's like 50 grand, which I'd imagine it probably is, then it has bits of the interior that feel like the £30,000 car it is at the base level, but they fit yeah. them that well. So the fabric in places, these these sort of fake straps in, in other bits, and like there's a bit of seat belt. The third spoke in the steering wheel is like a seat belt. It's, it's lovely, it's some lovely touches, and I do smile when I get in it, but um, okay. I think I'd want a softer one on smaller wheels, please. Okay. That sounds. That sounds. And what fair have you been driving? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to pull a Ginny in so much as I've been driving something, but I can't tell you too much about it because the embargo <laughs> is next Tuesday, and I think this podcast will come out on the Sunday, so I can't. But it's the it's the facelifted oh. Kia EV6. And I think I'm allowed to say that much. So it's got a new mm -hmm. a new look, front slightly different look at the rear, some bits and pieces inside. Um, I can't. <laughs> I'm sworn to secrecy, otherwise we'll break an NDA. But it's. Um, I thought it was good. I think they've improved the areas that needed improving, um, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's a it's a clever facelift. It's probably you know what that car needed. Um, we've yet to drive the Arnic Five with the facelift for the 2024 2025 model year one, so I'll be interested to see if that has the same improvements across it. But um, yeah, it was good. It's very nice. Mm -hmm. Nice day at Kia's headquarters. They very kindly they've mm -hmm. got an in house rapid charger. Tom, that's that's the ultimate mm -hmm. flex, isn't it? So um, well, they had those in Nissan, though. I think they had a few of those. Yeah, did they? It was very nice. I drove yeah. there and and they stuck the car on charge for me. And by the time it, I was ready to go, it's fully charged. So thank you very much, Kia. Nice. Full report nice. in the next in next issue. Oh, next issue. Gosh. <laughs> Full report will be on next week when I update the uh, review for the Kia EV6 on the site. So yeah, it's mm. all good. That's what mm. I've been doing. Uh, can I have a, an, another moan? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm aware that this podcast has be has become a uh, moaning about technology because we're old fogies, but well, two old two old so, blokes moaning about stuff, as somebody commented last week. Yes, yeah, well, exactly, yeah. But it's something I've noticed, especially this week with the mini, but it's also on the Lexus that I, I get to drive. And they have these automatic braking systems when you're at 
obviously at high speed, and that's a good thing if you haven't noticed a car moving off and all that. But they also do it at low speed, and they mm. think, you know, you're going to bump into something. But I was trying to park in a multi-story car park yesterday in the Mini, and it thinks that a pillar's too close, and I need to be close to the pillar because there's a Range Rover parked next to me on the white light. And it goes, beep, 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 and then it jams on the brakes. Yeah. And you immediately think once it's jammed on the brakes that you've hit something. So you're like, oh, God. And it and feels like you've hit something, you doesn't it? it? Yeah. Yeah. It feels like you have because and it's such you a have strong to, break. You have to, yeah. And, and bearing in mind, I'm probably like a foot or 30 yeah. centimeters for younger viewers um, from the the, um, the back of it at this time, the back of the space. So then you have to kind of bypass it by pushing down hard on the accelerator and it goes, okay, all right. Then it releases the brakes. Then you leap back. <laughs> and then well, do I think cause you're the actually accident. going to. Yeah. yeah. And the Lexus does it as well because my driveway, I try and get as close as I can to the, the garage door so that we can get another car past and things. And it's just, it goes, beep, 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 beep. and it's not even when the, the parking sensors have gone to the full beep that it does it, jams on the brakes. And you're like, oh, well, I'll leave it there. And you're still a foot from the door. So it's like, oh, you have to get in again and then try and do it. It's infuriating. Yeah, the, the Fiat and the Bath 500 has this like um, auto hold thing on it. So it mm. automatically puts the brakes on. It's, but it, you need so much throttle to overcome the sort of stiction of it putting the brakes on and you're yeah. trying to maneuver in a small space and it's you, you touch it and it kind of as you say it leaps forward leaps backwards yeah there's i mean mm. that's the worst one i've come across i mean the ionic and the i3 just kind of glide the i the, fortunately mm. the i3 is too old to have any of that stuff on it but when i drove the dolphin mm. last week uh, the emergency braking thing came in a couple of times scared the life out of me because i was a busy mm. roundabout and you know what it's like sometimes mm. when there's a gap you kind of almost have to go mm. where the car's in front of you, so you'd be in the gap behind him before mm. the next yep. car comes along there. Yep. But because it detected there was a car moving in front of me, which it was, it was just clearing out the way, it slammed the brakes mm. on. Uh, you know, mm. fortunately, the guy behind me had his wits about him and, and, and didn't run into the back of me. But, yeah, it really, I really lost all confidence in it after that. But, um, yeah, they're not uh, – mm. certainly – I know a few people have had – MG4s had similar phantom braking things as well, haven't they, and lane changing. So. Mm. It's, you know, it's great, as you say, great when it works, but it doesn't work a lot. Mike's word of the week. I'm going to make a note of this. That was good. You What's had that? a good one last week that I can't remember. Aperture. But this week, aperture stick- last week. Uh, aperture. So, so this week it's stiction. I like stiction. that. Stiction. Yeah. Yeah. Good word. Yeah. That's good. I'll be doing a full dictionary of them by the end of the season. <laughs> anyway, we, 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 we waffle on. I gather you spent the evening with... Um, with one of China's premier automotive manufacturers last night, I did. I, I went. I went to the official brand launch of Amoda. Um, well, they weren't really telling us anything we didn't know because the things like the prices were already on their website when before I went. But uh, it was interesting to chat to them about uh, where they're going and the uh, the issues they will face. I think um, selling the cars on on the plus side, what I think they've done, which is very clever, is to move into showrooms where. There have been brands like Peugeot before who've uh, got rid of a load of their dealers um, and Nissan, Hyundai, et cetera, and have therefore got this sort of ready, ready-made customer base of people who Ever. like the dealer. And now yeah. they're wandering and say, I want to replace my Peugeot. And they'll go, well, we can't do that for you anymore. We don't do Peugeot. How about these Amodas? And they've got a seven-year warranty and they're, they've got electric seats and they're really well equipped. And they'll go, oh, yes, thanks very much. I'll trust what you're saying. Um the struggle I think they will face is that um, the, the electric car E5 mm-hmm. is £33,055, which is right. you know, it's all right for a, for a list price, starting price. The trouble is that everybody else is in this kind of panic and selling off their electric cars much cheaper than that. So yeah. an MG ZS at the moment, you can get one for just above £20,000 um, at certain dealers. Uh, so are you going to spend 13,000 more on a, on a motor? So I was saying to the product guy yesterday, look at the moment, your PCP with 0% finance, it's 363 pounds a month. And that's with 5,000 pounds down four years, 10,000 miles a year. Yeah. And you think, Oh, well, okay. And then a, uh, a Tesla model Y at the moment on a contract hire admittedly, um, but is 299 a month with the same terms. And a Honda ENY1, which is seems to be always on a deal, is like £249 yeah. a month. Yeah, yeah. So are you going to spend £110 a month more 
on a brand you've never heard of. Oh, I think that's a tricky sell. I think it is. I think you need a, a huge carrot on the end of the stick to be able to take a punt on a brand. You know, let's face it. I mean, we've been in the business a long time and, you know, it's still a new brand to mm. us. If you think it's going to be a new brand to lots of people who've never heard of it. So, yeah, you kind of need something more, mm. don't you, than just being the same price or even a little bit more than than everybody else. But, yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd be interested to see how they go yeah. on, won't it? Yeah. In other news, there's another, uh, another keep sticking mm. with Chinese, Chinese manufacturer. Cars built in China, shall we say. Uh, the Smart Hashtag 5's made its debut time. And you know I like a Smart. Yeah. I've got an old one. But it's one. It's and I huge. quite like a Smart. Um, I quite like the new Smarts. I think the yeah. Hashtag 1 is uh, a great car. I think the, the Hashtag 3 is a really good car. I really like that car when I drove it. So a 5, I mean, it's not a Smart in that it's not small. But um, I, I like the look of it. I think it'll be great. Yeah, I was looking at the numbers this morning and it's, you know, it's 100 kilowatt hour battery, 348 mile range, 800 volt electrical system charging architecture, 4.7 meters long. There's going to be a 637 brake horse <laughs> Brabus version, which nobody needs. But that's that, I think that's more, that makes it more than an Ionic 5N, doesn't it? So that's kind of mm -hmm. nuts. Um, and it's yeah. going to be 42, 42 grand, so Enyak money, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you do forget how fast those Barabbas ones are. <laughs> it's completely <laughs> unnecessary, isn't it? <laughs> it's totally unnecessary. Um, my dad, uh, my dad update. Um, he's bought a he's bought a hashtag mm. three, Tom, based on your video. Oh, not, not entirely on your video. You went to test drive it about three times, but um, yeah. So, did he get he's on with the, the cheetah? Pleasure. It's got the cheetah on or it. Is it a wolf? The I can't remember. He yeah. No, it's a, he preferred the cheetah to the fox. So there you yeah. go. But yeah, I mean, I'm, don't it's know what we're talking about. <laughs> yes, there's uh, on the infotainment system on um, on both the hashtag one and the hashtag three. There is a, a animal to help you, isn't there, Tom? It's like one of those annoying things on Microsoft Word that used to say, "I think you're writing a list." Was it like that? Wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, like the paperclip, and it, it sits there in the corner. If it's not doing anything for you, it sits there in the corner and does things like lick its paw and get up occasionally and stretch. Just to distract you from driving it. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't I think, quite a... No. A, I wonder how long that'll last with my dad. I'm sure I probably want to switch that. What, <laughs> what what animal do you think is going to be in the five? Oh, yeah. What didn't they do? They've had a... a cheat. There'll be a monkey or something, wouldn't it? No, something off-roady. What's that going to be? A mountain goat. <laughs> okay. All right. Just take bets on it. If you think you know what's going to be the... Uh, <laughs> Annoying animated character in the hashtag five. Leave us a comment if you're watching this on the YouTube uh, version. Mm. What else have we got, Tom? Um, well, we're well, talking of, uh, of money as we were with the Amoda. Um, uh, Biggish news story this week is that the new Frontera, new Vauxhall Frontera, mm. um, it's got petrol price parity, which sounds like a, uh, a tongue twister. It's, but yeah. the petrol version uh, and the base model petrol version as well is the same price as the electric, which is 23495 which is pretty bloody good value because it's a big it car. Uh, I mean, it's got no power, uh, but neither is the petrol one. In fact, the electric one has slightly more power than the entry-level petrol. Okay. Um, the only disadvantage, I suppose, is that you can get seven seats in the petrol, although it's a 550-quid option. Um, but that's amazing, really, because if you look at cars like the Mocha, the... Uh, Electric versions are seven grand plus yeah. more expensive than the. Uh, so it's, it's kind of big news, really, isn't it? That's now you can just get to choose which you want and it's the same price. And you can get the seven seater version, is that right? In electric. You can seven seat uh, only on petrol. You can't get it in the electric. Well, I was going to say, I think the, uh, cause the, the Air Cross, seat, which yeah. is, yeah. I guess, the sister car is is, is limited yeah. as well. That's only got five, five seats, but. Uh... Interesting. But, yeah, yeah I mean, four nine five. I mean, I know. yeah, I mean, so that's the price of a mid-range Skoda Fabia these days, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, you're you're right. And that, as you say, for a, a reasonably sized family car, that's that's pretty good. And, and Vauxhall are legendary on the monthlies, aren't they? Just just you know, yeah. it's going to be competitively. Yeah. And priced if you're one of the Chinese manufacturers, that's that's going to be the issue, isn't it? Because if you're like you had that BYD Dolphin in, and that was 26. That's, that's and this two is, grand more than Frontera that. Frontera is a and bigger car. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so it's going to interesting times. Mm. Yeah, it is. It seems like the uh, the legacy European manufacturers are kind of finally getting their act together with price. 
doesn't it? Because they're just launching yep. so many cars. They haven't got headroom for everything. They're going to have to space. Not everything can be a 33 grand SUV, can it? It has to have stuff. No. I know that now. So it's good. It's encouraging times. Mm. Tom, mm. we have people who want uh, your buying advice. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw this. So, uh, shall I start with uh, Wayne Follett? Yeah. Uh, hope you're all well. Thanks for the work you put in. Uh, you're welcome. Big fanboy of electrifying.com. Excellent. Uh, I'm wondering why base spec models of cars are rarely tested. I used to be a buyer of cars that had to have everything. With lots of option boxes, ticks. I must have been a dealer's dream. These days I flipped. I look at the lowest base spec of cars that interest me. I currently have an MG4 SESR, owned since 2002. Software glitches and kamikaze lane departure reactions aside, it's been a great car. I'm now looking for its replacement. I've shortlisted the EX30 core trim, began E-Tech Evolution and Kia EV6 Air. Would you consider comparing base spec models when reviewing in future? Oh, and which of these should I choose? Um... Well, first of all, why we don't test them is because we have to rely on what the manufacturers have got on their fleets, and the manufacturers will obviously load up everything with options because they want to show them off, and they want them to look good in pictures, so they don't want them on 13-inch wheels with plastic wheel covers. <laughs> um, the other thing I would say is, having worked in car makers, uh, they don't generally have many base models uh, on their... They don't make any. Because uh, they don't make as much money on it. If you go into a dealer and you say, I want a base model, they'll say, well, you have to wait six months um, and uh, it will cost you £2 a month less on the um, uh, on the payments because the residual values aren't as good, but also you're stretching it out over several years. So why don't you just pay the £2 a month more and have the car that's got nicer alloy wheels and has got a sunroof and has got all these nice things? Um, and the other way that they get you out of the base models is they put things on the model up that you might want. So heated seats will be part of the you know, GLX. It would have been in the old days, wouldn't it? So you just think, oh, well, I really want that. Or they put it in a pack. So yeah. uh, you might want uh, something that's, uh, I don't know, Apple CarPlay, for example, is something you now consider essential, but you have to buy it in a pack along with, um, uh, an alloy wheel upgrade or LED headlamps or something like that. So it's almost impossible. So it, it, he uh, Wayne mentions here the EX30 core trim, which is something they've just announced. If you go on the Volvo website, you have to wait, I think it's six to nine months for a core, it says. <laughs> yeah. But they've got one of the next one up and they've got five grand off it. So you're just never going to buy it. Um. Maybe Kia will bring in some EV3 airs. I don't know. But uh, I, don't know. I think, I think the air is. Them. Yeah, I think air is going to be one of their main ones, isn't it? They may bring something in after that. Um, and I think, the, I mean, the other, indi- I can see it from both sides. And I can understand what Wayne says. And we used to have it on magazines we worked for before. People used to say, why don't you, you test the cheaper ones? Um, but also, when we've got a car that's got a lot of options in, we do get to test what it you know, those options are like, because if you imagine we'd had a base spec EV6 or Ionic 5 delivered and someone said, well, is the, is the vehicle to load worth having? And you say, well, I don't know, because mm. it didn't have it on it. At least the, if we have a car that does have a few bells and whistles on, we can at least test those out. Um, mm. And as you say, car manufacturers are very clever people. They have entire departments dedicated to tempting to you into the car above, don't they? So it's an, in, it's, it's not mm-hmm. done by accident, but uh, yeah. So which of these, these cars, so he's got an EV3 air, a Megane E-Tech Evolution and a EX30 core, Tom, what's, what would you have out of those? Well, I'd imagine the Kia EV3 is going to be great. I mean, I haven't seen it other than in videos and things, but it yeah. does sound very good. I, um, I really like the Megane as well. Uh, I think it's great value. Um, EX30 I don't get on with I would imagine it's probably best in its base model iteration rather than the top ones Yeah. Um, but uh, personally I think it's okay but there are things that bother me about it so I would much rather one of the other two um, okay. and I'd imagine the Kia is probably going to be the the most interesting of those in terms of charging speeds and the Rage. way it looks, warranty, yeah. etc., isn't it? What, what do you think? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it is. And it, it, you know, you've got an eighty kilowatt hour battery option in that EV three. So, if, mm. in, and you can get that in the 
Kira have been quite clever because you can get that in the air spec, so you can get the base model, but with the big battery. Because the old uh, one of the great playbooks of car manufacturers, mm. wasn't it? So if you want the big battery, you've got to have mm. the GLX. You've got to have the kind of range topping model to get that. Whereas mm. Kia haven't done that. They've, you can get the. I think it's to give them a headline figure in terms of range because uh, the air is a, is the front drive, two wheel drive one, uh, big battery. So you've got a with the smallest figure. wheels. Yeah, 370 something miles range, which is yeah, for the car in that category mm. is nuts, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah I think I think I think, I think it's probably the wheels as well, isn't it, Mike? Because mm. if we see it so much, I think on like big Audis, having a bigger wheel option knocks 20, 22 miles yeah. off your range. And you think, oh my God, I mean, that's, that's a lot. I, isn't I it? like small wheels these days because they're squishy and I hate the ride on, on low profile tyres. But you think about if you were stuck 20 miles from home and you're on zero range and you think if i've got the smaller wheel option i'd be home by now it's like <laughs> it's it's quite a big thing isn't it it's like do you go for that appeal of having those bling wheels or do you uh, do you go for the extra range and efficiency i think it was like 15 miles on because i went my i3s i had the optional 20 inch wheels and mm. it was i think it was about 15 miles difference but do I regret? Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not sure. I do regret it because you can't you can't miss what you didn't have effectively. But um, yeah, it was. I do I do sometimes wonder, you know, whether that was a smart decision. But there we go. Yeah. Do they get wider as well? Because on the i3, they're very skinny tires, aren't you? You imagine that's what the uh, what the difference the, would be. The rolling. Yeah, resistance. it was. I mean, I made a lot of mistakes when I ordered that car, as we know. But um, yeah, those wheels <laughs> because the, the tires for the i3s with those optional ones are. There's only one company that makes them, Bridgestone. That's it. So it's basically a cartel. They charge what they like for those tyres. And hopefully mm-hmm. they've made them out of bubble gum as well because, you know, the i3 isn't a very heavy car and I'm not very heavy right-footed at all. But I've done. I've gone through two sets of tyres, three sets of tyres in the, in the, in the 40,000 miles that I've had it. So, yeah, they wear, they're just they're sitting on the driveway. They seem to wear out. It's incredible, but they are very, <laughs> they're, they're really, really soft tires as well. So obviously a performance spec compound, whatever, but um, yeah, I mean, the ones on the Ionic, I've done nearly 18,000 miles in the Ionic and it's like new and that's a two and a half, 2.3 ton car. And you'd expect that to churn mm. through its tires, but it, it hasn't at all. So there you go. Mm. Bad mm. Our leaf gets through tires quite quickly, but it's entirely through pothole damage. We never wear out a set of tyres on the leaf. It's just, oh, another one's gone, another one. And inevitably, the pothole damage is on the brand new tyre, not on the uh, the ones that are slightly older. It's funny, I was talking about tyre wear. I was talking to somebody from Kia on the EV6 uh, drive, and he said that uh, the cars that used to go through tyres so much were the original um, e-Nero. Do you remember it had something like 400 newton metres of torque through the front wheels? And you just yeah. there was no easy yeah. way of, of getting that thing off the line, wasn't there, without you know, bags and bags of wheel spin. So yeah. I said when it changed to the Nero EV, because they dropped the torque down, almost half the torque or something, didn't they, in that motor? And all of a sudden, the people aren't yeah. churning through tyres as much. So, And they yeah. changed the software as well, I think they were saying, because mm. it, it just meant that it would react faster. It would know when the wheel was spinning. Before, it was like kind of old-fashioned yeah, traction yeah, control. You could almost feel the... <laughs> and now it's a bit smoother, so it would just cut the power. Yeah, yeah. No, I would say it was it was a bit mad that early that first generation um, Nero EV. Tom, I bet we've had an amazing post bag this week, Tom. Oh, um, yeah, it had been really good. Um, if you're wondering what we're talking about and you're listening to this on a podcast um, app, the um, this podcast is all avail- also available on the electrifying.com video channel, and we have comments at the bottom of it. Uh, would we encourage people to to say whether they've liked or hated what we've said? Um, you can also email us at podcast at electrifying.com if you've got any buying inquiry, buying query, or if you don't like anything we've said or think we've missed something or got something wrong, which is very common. But um, a very good post bag this week, Tom, last week, because I was moaning that my dad had had problems with dealers and even just to just getting a test drive. Uh, do you remember we put it out there and said, are there anyone out there mm. who's got any good good dealer stories we've had a few we've also had a few people uh, similar experiences uh to myself and my dad so i'm going to start with um the continued voyage 3746 uh winners skoda garage in cinderford are good for ev cars great service and helpful how enyak was supplied by them and we will certainly back when the time comes to swap 
There we go, Tom. Oh, We've a podcast excellent. mentioning the yep. Enyaq, so that's good, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Uh, Gareth Jordan I've mentioned the Leaf as well, so we've got yeah, the full bingo. Yes. And I've mentioned the i3, so you know, all systems are good, aren't they? Um, Gareth Jordan 42 says, um, I, I had an initial fairly long list of cars to look from from dealers coming up to the end of his current lease, and I really struggled to find a dealer that even had an electric car in the showroom, let alone one for test drive. When I asked, most of the salespeople fogged me off saying they were hoping to get one later in the year. The only exceptions were BMW, Polestar, Kia, and Genesis. It has been very frustrating. So, yeah, that's that's bad, isn't it? Mm. Paul Wilson-Smith um, says, uh, the customer service with Cooper dealers is truly terrible. So good to hear it's not just my experience. I think my, my dad tried to take a test drive, and they said that um, the, 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 it's the salesman's car, and um, he wasn't in, so he had to come back later to drive it. So, yeah, I mean, it's just... It's, and a good example of, of, of mm. how dealers aren't really sort of managing their do well with their customers. Mm. There's one uh, Stuart Anderson twenty three fourteen who says, like Mike, I found that dealerships don't have electric demonstrators. I'm redoing a two year business lease, and it's been a bit of a pain. I'm stuck between a Kona EV or facelifted Volkswagen ID three Pro S. Which guys, uh, which would you recommend or have? Now, before we get to that, this is an interesting point about dealerships and uh, leasing is that if you go to a dealership for a test drive and they say, how do you intend to buy this? And you say, well, I'm getting it through my company car or I'm getting it through a, a salary sacrifice or something. Unless the dealer can supply that car as part of that, there's absolutely no benefit for them, except maybe they'll get it for servicing eventually, in letting you test drive that car. It's a waste of their time. It's a waste of their demonstrator. And what incentive is there for them to to do anything for you? Because they're going to get nothing from it. Um, and that's a big problem. The other problem mm. is that when you get a lease car, it's delivered to your house by a bloke in a high-vis jacket on a trailer who hands you the keys and gets you to sign and then goes away. And you're left with a brand new car with absolutely no handover. And electric cars, you need a handover because they're, they're complicated, very different things. And a neighbour of mine had her Audi e-tron handed over like that and she just came knocking and, oh, can you can you come and show me how this works? And I'm like, yeah, I happily go through it mm. what i knew but an audi dealer would do it so much better so i think there needs to be some way for manufacturers to have a demo fleet for these people or and some sort of hand even if it's only on a video to to help people out because it's a real sort of blind spot how do you choose yeah absolutely yeah that uh, does seem nuts which would you have then Kona EV or ID3 Pro S? Well, you know I'm weird, so I would have the um, I'd have the uh, I'd have the ID3, Tom. Mm, I think I'd have to have the ID3 purely because I can't get on with the Kona's looks. Uh, yeah, it's weird, I isn't it? I think that it's Robert probably a better Cop car kind of in most thing. ways, but but you know I'm I'm shallow and I couldn't walk out my front door and see that back end of that Kona. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 an acquired taste, isn't it? But I'm um, sure people do love yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, another another uh, shout out for um, Stephen Russell sixty seventy four who says Audi at Oldham in Manchester are fantastic free, fantastic free V purchases, great attention and knowledge, good customer service. Uh, and oh, Alan Gravy is making the same point as me. I share Mike's struggles trying to get test drive out of dealers. I think it's most EVs go to fleets and dealers think they're going to lease it from somewhere else. So yeah. I agree with okay. you, Alan. Okay. Um, as I say, we've had a lot, so many comments about this, and they were all really good. I'm so I'm sorry if we're banging on about it. But Bell Shooter says, um, Chorley Group are great EV dealers. Uh, they may be away from you, but their tech lead, Miles Roberts, uh, is a real EV evangelist. So Chorley Group sound like they're um, they're switched on for electric car sales. Um, David Payton, 1317, says, regarding test drives, we found the same thing, looking for a motability electric car, and no one has any testing cars. I guess that's the same thing as the leasing, isn't it, Tom? People will go and do it, spend yeah. two hours with a dealer, perhaps, and then then order it through motability. But I don't know. Do motability ones go through dealers as well? I must admit, I don't really, I'm not really sure. Uh, yeah, I think they do. Motability ones normally go through the dealer if it's okay. a motability dealer, and and they love it because then they get it back after three years. They get the prime ones back after three years, and um, uh, and they get to sell them twice effectively. So uh, I'm surprised uh, they're not on the case. Okay, and finally on this, um, Ian's three three two eight says um, I had the same buying experience when looking at changing my Tiguan petrol diesel car for an ID four, like an ID four. Hopeless, he says. 
No demo available at the weekend, so organized for 5.30 p.m. on a Friday. Arrived, and after 20 minutes of faffing around, they told me the manager had gone home in the demonstrator. <laughs> oh, God. That's, a, that's bad, isn't it? That's really bad. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, manufacturers need to definitely, there's a, you know, there is a gap here, isn't there? There is a, there's something missing in the whole sort of system of, of getting people into cars, getting them to try them. So, um, yeah, not good. Yeah. Um, there are some people who uh, had the same or similar experience to your Kia EV3 uh, launch event, Mike. Uh, oh, so Jim Ross 63 says, he's taking issue with you slightly, uh, the highly reflective oh. dashboard on the EV3 is only temporary. It's because they have a peelable plastic on top of them to keep the screen clean when so many people are looking at them, sticky fingers, etc. I've seen exactly the same thing on an EV3 demo in South Korea, and they peeled the plastic film back to reveal a very non-reflective dashboard underneath. Well, did that seem the, right? Did it seem like it if, had a... It looked very shiny, but if that's the case, I'd say that's a that's that's a poor decision because um, I wouldn't say it was the it was the thing that put my dad off buying one, but it was one of the factors, you know. And, and I, I, admittedly, it was inside a studio with studio lights, so I think any dashboard would probably reflect a little bit. Um, mm. But he wasn't the only one. You could see people touching it and pointing at the screen as if they, you know, you could see from inside the car that they were they had the same issue. Um, and given that the rest mm. of the car is is handled and got grubby fingerprints on and you know boot marks over it, it, it seems strange just covering that bit because you're not normally going to touch the top of the dashboard, are you? You know, it's going to be the mm. infotainment screen and all the all the steering wheel and everything like that. So, if that is the case and it was a protective um, film, it seems a bit of an odd decision. I would have, I would have personally I would have taken that off and allow people to have a look at the car as as they're going to buy it. But um, it may have been a prototype might have been a slightly different finish i don't know and um, we didn't chat to the guy mm. about it so you know there may have been a reason for it but you know not everyone wants to like us not everyone wants to like to ask to question ask questions do they they just want to have a look at it and just think if it doesn't yeah. work for me it doesn't work for me so there is a, a reflective windscreens question uh, later on but i won't won't jump here let's stick for the ev3 for Excellent. now uh uh so no pistons 443 uh, says your comment about having to applaud the car reminded me of an event I went to with a relative and I visited the States a few years ago. We went to a dealer unveiling some forgettable Honda saloon, but before they <laughs> removed the sheet, the dealers wanted us to clap in rhythm and do a kind of Mexican oh, wave. God. To my astonishment, everyone joined in. Being very British, I looked to my feet and hoped the ground would swallow me up. Uh, well, I could probably get excited about some cars, but not Honda would saloon. Would you applaud them, Tom? It was, no, not unless it's kind of from the... 70s or something i might applaud that <laughs> but why it's uh, a piece of metal and why would you applaud it why would you applaud an inanimate object i don't get this this you know yeah well, i suppose if it's something like a classic that someone's put their life and soul into i might okay. applaud it and yeah their, All right, their dedication but not not that yeah no okay um and uh somebody who whose <laughs> username looks like the cats walked across the keyboard. Uh, what, user XH7LP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says, Mike, you went to the EV3 experience. Did you get in the back seats? Many six foot and over, including myself at the event, uh, couldn't get into the rear because of the height of the seats and the small aperture opening of the rear doors. Now, the aperture opening of the rear doors, I think we talked about before. Yes. And modern end cap crash testing things means that I can't get in a Polestar, for example. I mean, they're just tiny because you open the door, which looks huge, yeah. and then you have to kind of fold yourself up so much that I can't get in without banging my head. So I don't know. Did you try in the back? I did get in the back. I don't really think I had much of an issue, but I think I may be, like you, slightly conditioned now to, um, mm. you know, I mean, the mocha. Do you remember that? I mean, you almost had to be threaded through yeah. to get into the back of a mocha. Uh, and Pulsar, as you yeah. say, has a lot of a lot of framework about um, mm. about the tops of the doors. I didn't think it was I didn't think it was terrible for the size of car. Um, I think the Volvo EX30 and the Smart hashtags have the same kind of climbing a little bit through a porthole. But once you're in, it was okay. I mean, it was it wasn't too much of a threshold to get over. And once you're in there, there's loads of there's loads of space. So yeah, I mean, it's not it's not great, but at the end of the day, it's a quite a small car. Um, and as mm. you say, there's going to be a lot of metal around you to look after you. So I didn't think it was the worst car mm -hmm. I've driven for that. That's what I'll say. But mm. um, yeah, if you are, if you're regularly carrying 
six foot plus teenagers, kids, whatever, then um, yeah, I would, I would urge them to try. But I think it, once you're in, it's uh, there's bags of room, so not too bad. Mm. Okay, now l- mm. last week, Tom, we helped out a reader. Do you remember? Fifteen thousand pound budget needed a yep. big boot, and yep. um, he'd kind mm-hmm. of short. He'd kind of done our job for us because he shortly listed a Citroen EC4, uh, which we kind of all agreed was uh, was actually a really good choice. And um, Mike, Mike Dave, Mike A Davis, Mika Davis, six sixty um, on YouTube says, "I also have a Citroen EC4 on lease as a family car. Uh, my fourteen year old son is six foot. All of us fit easily. The best thing about the EC4 is the comfort. Suspension is brilliant. Second hand, they are without doubt stunning deals. So yeah, this is this is good to know. A few people are snapping those up, aren't they? Just on EC4s, used EC4s. I've been looking on our uh, the website for EC4 deals, and they are really cheap they're one of the cars that if you get them at a year old they are yeah. 15 16 thousand pounds so uh i look and there's you know ones with less than a thousand miles for uh, 16 grand and you think that's the same price used as something like a, a corsa um and i think that's a really good deal and i do like the ec4 because of that comfort thing because i'm an old yeah. gimmer and i <laughs> do think cars should be able to go over potholes without shaking your fillings out um so yeah, yeah ec4 no I would agree, and it and the interior has got that nice mix of it's got enough tech, but it's still kind of slightly old school in terms of buttons and everything. It's an easy car to get on with. You're moving from an internal combustion car yep. to electric. Uh, EC4 is a fabulous switch, isn't it? Because you, it's not yep. completely out there. Um, it's still all very familiar, so that's good. Um, Stephen Wensley and nine three two eight. Um, on the same subject for a 15k alternative to C-Max. Early Jaguar I-Paces can be had for that now. And have a 650 litres of boot space, which is huge. And only a few centimetres longer than a C-Max. Would you take a punt on a on an early I-Pace, Tom? I think I'd want a warranty. Yeah. They've got a reputation too. for being a little bit flaky, haven't they? They have. I think of that kind of mark. It's going to be a lot older than... charging. The- yeah, 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 and I think yeah, because it's going to be a lot older car than the the EC4 is, isn't it? It's so probably three. Mm. It's probably MOT time for a lot of those. So it's um, mm. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we've had um, oh, some nonsense and some, some complaints, Mike. Uh, as always, always we love. So the was bike bloke was bike bloke nine eight four eight and four six. Sorry. Uh, so that's was bike bloke. That's like us, Mike, isn't it? Yeah, old bikers were bike blokes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I bought a BYD Dolphin as a replacement for an ID3. I love it. Great quality and range of features for far less than my VW. VW showed no interest in selling me a VW, but BYD had an amazing PCP offer. I can see the reflections from the dash, but it's not caused a problem at all because I was moaning about the reflections on the dash when I had a BYD Dolphin. So uh, I have sent Manos, who's going to be editing this, a picture that I took of the BYD (laughs) Dolphin when I was trying to reverse out of a space and then not hit a door and you will see how bad it was because it was, I had to get out and have a look. That's how bad it was in bright sunlight. So the viewers can make up their own mind. If you're listening to this on an app, I'm I'm sorry, you have to go and look on YouTube if you want to see the picture, but it was bad. Uh, Sunny D uh, 6291 says, Hi guys, it'd be great if you'd include which new EVs will be released during that month's podcast. Uh, well, we kind of do, don't we? Talk about what's going to be released. I think I think Maybe. we do. And and on that subject, I mean, we're not doing we're talking monthly, but next week we're filming a uh, video about the roundtable video about all the electric cars that are coming in 2025. Um, I did some research on that for yesterday. yesterday so that's going to be coming out. I try to work out my timings um, the next week from when you this video or this podcast drops. So keep an eye on the electrifying.com YouTube channel because we've got a long 20-minute video about all the best ones that are coming next year. So, yes, that's happening. Excellent. Um, and PD, oh, P. Decaux, do you think like the uh, yeah, advertising? Pete, that's what I company, thought, yeah. Like the bus stop, Could yeah, be. yeah. Uh, I met a man earlier this year who was planning a round Europe trip in an E-Up. It was kitted out with a bed, fridge and stove so he could camp in it. I want to see this because <laughs> you, you probably have trouble sleeping in the Ionic, but um, uh, an E-Up camper sounds brilliant. Maybe you'll have to have his like 
feet up on the dashboard or something when he's got the rest of the, the uh, seats folded down. But uh, yeah, he sounds like a legend. <laughs> I wonder if it's, it's one of the early ones. It's going to pong a bit, isn't it, by the end? Oh, it's going to be awful. <laughs> what if it's one of those early ones as well, the 19 kilowatt hour battery one? That would be the real... Oh, God. That would be hardcore, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, well, you know, I, if, if you know of this person, um, please let us know <laughs> if he's got some sort of social media presence, because I'd love to follow that. That would be good. Um, three more to finish off for today. Um, Andy Smith, 9913, says, Mike, white steak is still going strong, which is good news. I think last week we had about camping in cars and someone said they were woken yeah. up from camping in their car by the noise of white snake doing a sound check at the Reading Festival. So, And I questioned whether they were still going. <laughs> Turns out they are, which is great news. Um, Keith Willis, 5562, says, Tom, the police definitely have Hyundai and Kia cars. I regularly drive between Southampton and Plymouth and have seen many of them. Most internal combustion and EV. Maybe it's a regional buying decision. Uh, well, no, I know they have Hyundai's. I, I was talking about Kia. So Hyundai well, had a massive deal with the Met Police for a while where they replaced Vauxhalls and all sorts. It was a bit of a coup for them. Yeah. Um, uh, Kia's were the one I don't think they have any or many. Uh, I think somebody mentioned that the British Transport Police have Kia EV6s. And we did actually talk to somebody from the Kia, uh, from the... Um, British Transport Police about that. And they were trying various electric cars to see how they got on with them. And they said they had real trouble getting cars out of Kia because the EV6 was quite new and they didn't want to sell them to them. I think they had to pretend to be, you know, Mr. British Transport Police uh, in order to to buy them. And they had them on trial. I don't know if they bought any more, but um, I think they quite liked them and thought they were quite good. But uh, they didn't get any support at all from Kia. Oh, gosh. Well, there you go. That's interesting. Very interesting. And finally, um, another, another, another someone correcting us, Tom, which is, is you know, this isn't good. Uh, Glenn, Glenn Lambert, 5112, and Ifan Pl- Lapage 1033 says, DeLorean in the Back to Future, the engines still work with petrol, only the time circuits were nuclear, st- stroke lightning, stroke electric. So there we go, Tom. I think we might have said that the DeLorean, <laughs> suggested that DeLorean was electric, but... Um, Electric car. Oh, well, I stand corrected. So uh, perhaps it seemed so crazy back then that the car would actually run on electricity. You'll have to watch uh, all four of them. Or is there four? Is there five? I can't can I, can I do it on electrifying time, do you think? <laughs> Just sit Give there. It a try. It's like, I'm busy. I'm watching Back to the Future to get my facts straight in future. <laughs> well there you go so that's what tom will be doing next week um that's it for this week thank you very much if you have been listening um please uh, like and subscribe to the youtube channel and also um like and leave us a comment if you listen to this on a podcast i think it makes a huge difference so thanks for listening and we'll see you next week bye see you next week bye